God is good. And all the time. Amen. We're going to uh, ask you to turn in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be there <clears throat> over the course of the next few weeks as we're taking a look at a new series through Christmas. Uh, we're looking at the praises of Christmas, uh, the praises given by several different individuals. And we're going to look at uh, the, the praise of Mary. We're going to look at uh, some praises by Simeon, who was a prophet, and many other individuals. But today we start uh, with uh, looking at the uh, praise, the heavenly praise of Gabriel, the angel who comes down to visit with Mary. And, uh, you know, this message is, is, uh, is coming about. He's bringing a message from God to Mary. And so there are elements of praise that we find that the angel gives them to the Lord uh, this Christmas season. So, uh, oh, the first Christmas, that is. And my, my goal is in this message is to show us that Christmas time, now, now get, don't get me wrong, Easter is my favorite holiday. Because if it weren't for the resurrection of Jesus, I wouldn't be a Christian, quite frankly. And it was the resurrection of Jesus and the historical validity of that that God used to bring me back to, a, to faith, quite frankly. Uh, but as people said, you can't have an Easter if you first don't have a Christmas. And so uh, the, the wonderful thing about Christmas is we, we celebrate the incarnation of Christ. But unfortunately, sometimes I feel we get too busy during the Christmas season. We, we align our calendars with too much stuff, quite frankly. And I believe Christmas has been too commercialized to the point that we lose the impact about what we're even talking about, which is Jesus Christ, the, the incarnation where God left the throne of heaven and come to live as one of us. Can you imagine that? Leaving the throne of heaven where he had never experienced any evil, never experienced any heartache, never experienced anything of the sort, to come and be born in a manger. You know what they used a manger for? It's a feeding trough for the animals. The, the God of God, the creation, uh, God of all creation, left the thrones and portal of heaven to be born in a lowly manger. And praise God for the wonderful incarnation we celebrate this Christmas. So we're going to ask, if you will, turn to uh, Luke chapter 21, verses 26 through 38. And yes. I ask that you please stand in honor of the reading and hearing of God's precious holy word. Today we're looking at the heavenly praise given by Gabriel, and we want to specifically look at four elements of this praise. Starting with verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was, uh, yeah, angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Now understand that betrothal uh, was a lot stronger then than it is now. To be betrothed to a person meant that you were really certified certified as married at that time. Uh, but the, the, the wedding ceremony hadn't happened until, uh, until the wedding day. So you were in promise to this person. To a virgin betrothed to a man, a promise to this person, just had not had the ceremony, the official ceremony yet, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, possibly her aunt, uh, maybe a cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, I love this verse, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. To kind of gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the ability to be in your house this morning. 
And Lord, we thank you for the men and women who keep us free to allow us the opportunity to, to freely we proclaim your word. And we also thank you for those who have long, long days gone past uh, who have given their lives so that we may have a copy of Scripture. This is truly a freedom that we enjoy on both fronts. Lord, we just ask, Lord, this morning that you would, as we, we praise you with this heavenly praise, and attempt to do so at least, Lord, that you would receive our praise given to you. And we just ask, Lord, that this message, that you would allow me to speak the words that need to be spoken, hold back any words that don't need to be spoken. And in through it all, Lord, we ask that you grant us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that will apply these truths and be better for it. For it's in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Now I have to admit, I love all kinds of music. I, I love all kinds of music. I love all kinds of Christian music. music. And I even love some secular music. In fact, God has used uh, music in, in amazing ways. In fact, every time some, God does something big for us, He actually has used a secular song, uh, a song that some of you may know. Uh, a, a, a secular song. The chorus of this song comes up. We, we, I heard it whenever I heard I was uh, whenever I was accepted in the PhD program. I heard it whenever I passed the test to get in the PhD program. I heard it whenever I was accepted at Westfield Baptist, Baptist Church. I heard it whenever uh, we learned that we were going to build a house. And that song is Journeys. Don't stop believing. Now I can't tell you why that's. Uh, see, she's singing it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, this song comes up every time something big happens in our lives. The chorus to that, don't stop believing. Now some people are going to maybe start singing it here. I better, better quit. I know Dole might. <laughs> it's showtime there. But anyhow, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times though we get caught up. We get caught up on the style of music and we, and, and we get caught up on the style of our praise instead of actually focusing on what praise is all about. And such is the case with, uh, with an old farmer and his wife named Martha. They, went to, they were lived in the country and uh, went to a country church, and they sung the classic hymns. Well, one weekend, uh, the, the farmer, farmer had some business uh, that took him to the city, and so he, while he was in the city, he went to this big church and came back home and was talking to Martha about his experience in this big city church. And she says, well, how, what was it like? And he says, well, it was really nice. It was a lot like our church. The preaching was good. The, the fellowship was fantastic. But they did one thing. They did one thing that was a little bit different than what we do. She said, what was that? She, he said, they sung these things called praise hymns. She said, well, what's a praise hymn? He said, well, it's a lot like our hymns, but it's a little more descriptive. She says, what do you mean? He says, well, let me put it like this. If a, reg a regular hymn would say, Martha... The cows are in the corn. But a praise hymn would be more descriptive. It might say, Oh, Martha, Martha, Martha. The cows, the cows, the cows, the cows are in the corn. The big cows, the small cows, the black and white cows. The cows, the cows, oh, Martha, the cows are in the corn. She said, Oh, wow. He said it was good. It was just different. You know, a lot of times we get so caught up on the style of music, we get so caught up on the way we worship and the way we praise that we forget and we fail to realize that the most important thing is that we praise the Lord. The most important thing is that we have a heavenly praise geared towards the Lord. You know, we all have different ways as we praise the Lord. Sometimes I'll praise the Lord by, by going out, by going out in the night sky and just looking up looking at the stars and looking at this beautiful creation that God has given us. We all have different ways we worship the Lord. But one of the things that Gabriel teaches us in the delivery of this message is that our praise must be heavenly centered. Our praise must be God centered. And we see four elements of this praise today. First and foremost, in verses 26 through 28, we see the element of connection. Now notice we see that this is in the sixth month. The sixth month speaks of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Elizabeth was past the age of childbearing years. But yet all throughout, yet this Elizabeth was, was allowed to have a son, a son who was very important to the Messianic ministry. If you look through the Old Testament, you see many prophecies that outline that when the Messiah would come, there was going to be a herald, there was going to be a forerunner who would come uh, 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 bringing forth the Messianic kingdom, bringing forth or, or proclaiming that the Messiah was going to come. It's kind of like if you think about this in ancient times, before a king, 
king came to a city. He would sing, send out a herald, and the herald would go to the city and says, Prepare yourselves, the king is coming. Prepare yourselves, the king is coming. And that's exactly what John the Baptist did. He says, To prepare yourselves, for the Messiah of God has arrived, and he is about to set forth the kingdom of God. So the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Gabriel was sent by God to a small town called Nazareth. And notice he calls Mary a favored woman. What he does is he makes a connection between the heavenly decree and the operations that's taking place on earth. He, he makes this connection between God and humanity. And Jesus ultimately made the, the, the best connection, the ultimate connection that could ever be made as he was God who came in the flesh. But you see, a lot of times I really believe in my heart of hearts a lot of times, especially Christmas time, a lot of times in life, we want God to be a Santa Claus rather than a Savior. We want someone to come along and give us a bunch of stuff with no expectations whatsoever. But is that what God is? Is that what God is like? You see, God didn't come just to bless you. God came to change you. God came to transform us from the people we are to make us into the image of Christ. Bill Mount's Greek scholar says that we have no, that no English translation gets the Lord's Prayer right. Not a one of them. Because he said there's a passage of Scripture where, where Jesus says, Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's where they massacre it. Because he says the Greek is so deep in that passage of Scripture, as is the Aramaic and the Hebrew. What Jesus is saying is, My Father in heaven... Whatever your decree is for my life, bring it forth through me. Whatever you want done in heaven, use me as your vessel to bring it forth on earth. But when God's will is done, that doesn't mean it's always going to be sunshine and roses. Amen? Because God never promises us an easy road. As we're going to see as we move through this, sometimes to make a diamond, you've got to put the, the elements in a lot of pressure. Amen. You put in a lot of pressure, and that's what creates a diamond. The prophecies tell of the Messiah that he was going to be a refiner of silver. And to refine silver, you've got to put it through the fire. You've got to put it through difficulties in life. You've got to put it through circumstances that the end result is a masterpiece. And that's what Jesus has come to do. He has come to cleanse us. He's come to transform us. That doesn't mean that everything in life is going to be easy. That doesn't mean that everything's going to be glorious. But what it does mean is that Romans 8.28 holds true. That in good times and bad, God is still God. And He's making a masterpiece out of our lives. And praise God for that, that when we praise God to make that connection between heaven and earth, but to not just to basically say, and I believe that we need to pray for one another, and I believe that we need to pray for ourselves. If we need help, go to the Lord. James tells us that a lot of times we have not because we ask not. But understand, I believe the whole focus of our prayer life should be, here I am, Lord, use me. Whatever your will is for my life, Use me. That's what Gabriel did, and we see ultimately that's what Mary herself did, as we'll see even more so next week. The second element uh, is the element of comfort. In verses 29 and 30, we see this element of comfort. Now notice that uh, when she saw him, she was troubled at the saying. Most times when angels appeared to give a message, it wasn't good news. For If you remember back in Genesis, when the angel showed up, Sodom and Gomorrah was about to be laid out. A lot of times when angels show up, someone's getting laid out. <laughs> you know, a lot of times. The news wasn't always good, but in this case, it was very good. But Mary was deeply troubled, especially hearing this news. And let's be honest, small towns then are the same as small towns today. Amen? News travels fast. News travels fast. And if you're a young woman, most likely Mary was 14 years of age, 14, maybe 15. If you show up and you're pregnant and that baby's not your husband's, do you think you're going to be the talk of the town? You say, oh, but wait, I can go tell them that an angel appeared to me that the child I'm bearing is of God's. Do you think people are going to believe you? <laughs> probably not. Probably not. People would probably have laughed. Uh, laughed at Mary, and Mary was going to, to face a tough, difficult road 
Her, her, her life was not going to be sunshine and roses. She was going to be the object of scorn, and, and people were going to despise her in her community because she had this child, and no one knew who the father was. But, of course, she did. So the, the element of comfort that we see in Gabriel's praise. Mary was intimidated, but notice he says... Fear not. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Be careful judging someone else because God may be doing something powerful in their life. Amen? Be careful judging someone else. And we as a church, I'm not talking about Westfield in particular. I'm talking about as American Christians, we have a horrible time judging one another. We have a horrible time with that. We try to judge. If, if anybody does something that's not our liking, we want to judge someone about it. For instance, Michael Vick. God has saved Michael Vick. He's become a Christian. But there are some people, because of what he did with the dogfighting, who says, well, he can't be saved. God would never save someone like that. God would never save someone like that. But if you believe that God can save a person, look at the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul held the coats of those who killed Stephen and was going after Christians to kill them. God got a hold of his life, and he became one of the most powerful missionaries that the world has ever seen. Be careful to judge someone, because let's be God. honest, if we were God... <laughs> Would anybody be saved? If I was God, would anybody ever be saved? Would I even be saved if I were God? Our walk with God should bring comfort to us and comfort to others. Yes, we are called to stand against evil, but the question we have to ask ourselves, do we really love the lost? Do we really love those who are caught up in sin? Do we really love those who are going against the ways of God? Do we really love them? Do we really love them? The church is losing people in America by rapid numbers. We must ask ourselves, are we truly loving people the way we should? And in, in, in reality, um, I don't mean that we should do things simply to appease those outside the church, but the reality is, is that people today are angry. You go on social media, you see it real quick. You see it very quickly. People are angry. I've noticed driving down the road, people would rather run you off the road than to slow down. Amen, Frank? I don't know what it is about Westfield Road. I noticed on old Westfield Road that I do the speed limit, but, man, you couldn't tell it by the cars coming up, and, the, and my eyes are really bad. I have to wear contact lenses. And there's a lot of these trucks that just shine their lights in my, in my rearview mirrors and blinds me, and so it only makes me go slower than faster. So if you see me and you're going up on my rear bumper trying to push me out of the way, just know my eyes are bad. It's going to slow me down rather than speed me up, just so you know. But people are so angry anymore. They really are. They're so angry. We as the children of God should find comfort this Christmas season. We should be filled with the love and compassion of God Almighty. Number three, we see the element of Christ-centeredness, verses 31 to 34. He says, Behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary says, How can this be, since I don't know a man? Now, isn't it interesting that Mary, Mary, despite all the details that were given about Jesus, she goes back to that point that how is this possible? How is this possible since I've not known a man? We see three things about this praise, about who Jesus would be. Number one, Jesus' birth was miraculous. Mary realized this, and, the, and Gabriel realized this, but he's pointing her back to the plan of God, bringing back the point that with humanity, these things may be impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. Amen? Nothing is impossible with God. Secondly, Jesus' name was meaningful. Jesus, or in Hebrew and Aramaic, His name would have been Yeshua. Just a powerful emphasis in that. Yeshua would be His actual name. Jesus is the English translation of that. Yeshua means God saves. Joshua is an equivalent. Amen? Amen. You good? <laughs> Joshua is an equivalent of the name Jesus. Uh, uh, Yeshua, Joshua, it means God is salvation. That's what it means. God saves. You see, names meant a lot in ancient times. You know, names meant a lot in, uh, in medieval times. And boy, I'm telling you what, I'm glad I wasn't born in ancient times or in medieval times. You know, you had some of these guys who were named Richard the Lionheart. That would be the name I would want, the Lionheart. But some people weren't given good names. I'm afraid mine would either have been Brian the Short or Brian the Fat. 
I'm not sure which you'd have been. <laughs> Chris is laughing. So <laughs> I don't know, but you know, they had these names, but names meant something. So to be called Jesus, it meant God is salvation or God saves. Thirdly, Jesus' work was majestic. He would be called the Son of the Most High, and He would have the throne of David. His reign would be forever. And, and Gabriel tells Mary that your son, he's going to be the salvation of God, and he's going to reign forever. But Mary, her mind goes back, and I'm not picking on Mary, but Mary's mind goes back. But wait, I've never known a man. You see, Gabriel's praise was Christ-centered. It was focused on Christ. And my prayer for us this Christmas season would be that we do the same thing. Christmas time is difficult for a lot of people. I met a guy not long ago who told me that through Thanksgiving and through the New Year is the most difficult time of his whole year. He's gone through a lot of tragedies. He's seen a lot of bad things happen. And it's very difficult. But I want to tell you this. The way to get through it is the same way we get through anything. Keep your eyes on Jesus and never take them off of Him. Because He will see us through any difficulty. He will see us through any storm. And if we understand what Christmas is truly all about, it's about God coming and dwelling among us, becoming one of us so that we could live. St. Athanasius of Alexandria was exiled four, time, four times in the 300s. Sometimes you can be persecuted for doing the right thing. Amen? Sometimes you can stand up for the right thing and have the right mindset in mind, but still be persecuted for that thing. He was exiled four times because of a heretic by the name of Arius. Arius was teaching, saying that Jesus was the first created being, but that Jesus wasn't eternal. Athanasius says, you're out of your mind. Jesus was eternal. He's the eternal Logos. He's God come in flesh. That's why they had the Council of Nicaea in 325 to settle this matter. There was a guy by the name of St. Nicholas of Myra who got so upset that he punched Arius in the mouth for, for bringing forth this heresy. Nicholas was escorted out after that. But anyhow, it's a very interesting story. But Athanasius was standing up for biblical principles, and he writes these words, No other could change corruption into incorruption but the Creator. No other could restore to man the lost image but the expressed image of the Father. No other could make mortality immortal but the very life itself. No other could teach us about the Father but the Son Himself. But He came also especially that the debt of our death due from all might be canceled. Did you realize that? That the debt of your death has been canceled because, canceled because of the risen King. Death doesn't exist anymore for the Christian. You know, that's what Jesus says. That anyone who lives and believes in Him don't really die. They go in the presence of God the Father. They don't really die. Death has died because of Christ. But the indwelling of His Word, His body became incorruptible. Then that Thus, in Christ's body, the death of all was fulfilled, and death and corruption extinguished forever. The question we have to ask ourselves this Christmas season is do we really want what we want, or do we want what Christ wants? Do we, do, are we, are we self-centered, or are we Christ-centered? And my prayer for us would be that we would focus on Christ and never take our eyes off of Him. And last but certainly not least, there's the element of courage. Did God call us to be afraid? Anybody want to answer that? No. Now, there's a lot of things that are scary going on in the world today. I mean, North Korea is designing a nuclear weapon, putting it on a missile that could very well reach our own nation. Iran's trying to do something similar. There are many nations out there. There's a lot of evil out there. There's a lot of depravity out there. There's some mean people out there in, in the world today. And so it would be easy for us to become frightened. It would be easy for us to, to, uh, to uh, allow these anxieties to overwhelm us but look what the angel says to Mary. For with God, nothing will be impossible. The power of the Most High would overshadow her. The Holy Spirit would come upon her. And with God, nothing would be impossible. You think about this. God was able to speak and all of creation came into existence. That's a lot of power. And that's why my life verse is Romans 8.31. Very simple. I really appreciate the Lord doing this because it is real easy to remember that if, uh, if God is for us, 
who can be against us? Quite honestly, if you have God on your side, if you have the, the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords on your side, there's no reason to fear. There's no reason to be succumbed, to succumb to all these anxieties that we have. I'm reminded of the 16th century uh, reformer by the name of Hugh Latimer. Hugh Latimer was asked to preach before King Henry VIII in England. And Latimer was known for standing for biblical principles and preached the word unapologetically no matter where he went. And he began, and everyone was kind of interesting to see what Latimer was going to say in front of King Henry VIII. And he started his message saying, Latimer, oh Latimer, do you remember that you were speaking before the high and mighty King Henry VIII, who has the power to command you to be sent to prison, and who can have your head cut off if it please him? Will you not take care to say nothing that will offend royal ears? And then he paused and continued saying, oh Latimer, Latimer, do you not remember that you were speaking before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, before him at whose throne King Henry VIII will stand, before him to whom one day you will have to give an account of yourself? Latimer, O oh Latimer, be faithful to your master and declare all of God's words. No matter if he was preaching to King Henry VIII or if he was preaching to a person on the street, he was going to preach the gospel. May we have that boldness. May we have that courage to preach the Word in season and out of season, to stand upon the authority of the Word of God no matter what may come our way. And praise God for that. Now, unfortunately, Latimer, uh, unfortunately King Henry VIII, his wife, was Queen Mary, who was also known as Bloody Mary. Yes, she was a real person, and she was evil to the core. And she eventually had his head cut off because of his bold preaching. But Gabriel's praise, praise includes the hope that God can do anything which provided him courage. This provided Mary courage to say, to basically, Here I am, Lord. No matter what your will for my life is, use me according to your purposes. So what does praise really look like? What should praise really look like? A story is told of a famous violinist, and I'll close with this who is to perform at a concert hall for a world, for a, of world renown. He stood before the packed house that night and played his violin, which mesmerized the audience with his prowess and skill. As he was going through the rendition, uh, he came to a close, and everyone gave him a standing ovation for a, ma a majestic and marvelous concert that he had given, and they cried out for an encore. So he came out and gave an encore. After the, second on, after the first encore, he went back and come out for a second encore, then a third, and then the fourth, and the fifth. And then finally after the fifth, he went off stage and finally closed the concert. Someone asked him and said, Why was it that you gave five encores? He said, Here's the reason why. Because my master, the one who taught me to play violin, was sitting in the crowd. And I was looking him at the first encore. He didn't stand up and give me he didn't give me a hand clap. At the second encore, he didn't do it. The third and fourth, he didn't do it. It wasn't until the fifth one that he finally stood up and started clapping and giving and, and, and thanking me and, and telling me that I did a good job. It was I was concerned. No matter of all the people who were there, I was most concerned about my master to make sure he was pleased with what I was doing. And isn't that what we should be doing as Christians? to have our focus, our praise on Christ. Friends, I'm going to tell you what, I'm just an old school evangelical preacher. If you want to raise your hands and give God glory, you go right at it. Amen? If you want to shout amen, you shout amen. You praise the Lord. Now, just don't come up and tackle the preacher and knock him out or anything like that. But you praise the Lord. You praise the Lord however God leads you. You give Him praise and, and make God the focus and center of your being. And I believe if we do that this Christmas season, no matter what we may be facing, Keep our eyes on the Master, and not only at Christmas time, but every single day of the year. Keep our eyes upon Him. Keep our focus upon Him, and let us praise Him. That's what Gabriel did, and that's ultimately what Mary did. And that my prayer is that what we, is that? Ooh, I'm getting too excited. That is what we would do as the people of God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to encourage you to come and respond to the call this morning. I want to tell you, it doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, God can save you. No matter how bad you've been, 
God can save you. I, I knew a preacher one time who formerly worked for the mafia. He was uh, one of those guys who went out and busted knees. And God got a hold of him and saved him, and he's now preaching the gospel. He said he has to be careful sometimes going in some hospitals because he runs across some of the people he knew in his former life, and they start backing up. But he says, I'm not the same man I used to be. If God can save him, he can save you. Or maybe you're here today, and maybe you're going through some difficulties in life. Maybe this Christmas season you're overwhelmed with some issue that may be taking place. And maybe you just want to come down and lay your burdens at the foot of the cross. We'll be here to pray with you. Whatever God is leading and doing in your life, we just encourage you to come as the Spirit calls. Kind of gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the true meaning of Christmas. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, that we're serving you, a God who loved us so much that you were willing to leave the comfort of heaven to come down and experience what it is to be human, to come and experience life as we experience it. But by doing so, by your death, you gave us life. And in our immortality, I mean, excuse me, in our mortality, you give us immortality because of the work on the cross and because of an empty tomb. Lord, we thank you for loving us as you did. You didn't have to come, but you did. And we thank you for loving us the way you do. And we just pray, Lord, that, this, that today and, and every day that follows, that we will praise you and we will give you glory for whatever, uh, whatever you do in our life. Help us, Lord, to be people who will give you praise in the good times, who will give you praise in the bad times, that no matter what may come, and no matter what the devil may throw at us, that we'll keep our eyes upon you. Have your will and your way in this time of invitation. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please stand as we sing our final selection.